Uh, dealing with divorce, difficult issues, biblical answers, lesson number three, what to do in case of divorce, part two. So in part one of this uh, section entitled what to do in case of divorce, I talked about what to do when divorce happens to somebody around you. you know, it's happening around you. How are you going to react to this thing, this event that's taking place in the life of someone uh, near to you? And uh, you know, we talked about the do's and don'ts of crisis management when divorce happens in your family or friends. So in this lesson, I want to talk about what to do when divorce is actually happening to you. Okay? Now the last thing that people hope for when they get married is the failure of, this mar of their marriage. You know, I've never met anyone who said, you know, I think our marriage will be good well, maybe two, three years, then I'm really looking forward to when it falls apart. You know, nobody thinks like that. Even, even people who get married a second time, even a third time, every time they get married, it's with the hope that they will succeed. So no, nobody ever goes into marriage with the, with the thought that it'll fail, okay? But it does, it does. We know that it happens uh, at a higher rate among those who are you know, non-religious, have no moral convictions, so, uh, those who are unfaithful, or those who don't practice the faith that they're taught as children, but it also, and we learned, it also happens, and quite, quite often, to sincere believers who are faithful and active in the church. It'd be nice and comfortable if we said to ourselves, well, that only happens to people who are really, you know, they're, they're only Christians in name only, but if you're a good Christian and you're really trying, that's not going to happen to you. False. Not true. Less often, of course, but it still happens. Uh, and even to people in this congregation, you know, we have, what, about 400 people in this congregation? I mean, a lot of people, half the church have been affected in uh, a very serious way uh, by divorce. Again, we can talk about the issue of marriage and divorce and remarriage, and we will talk about that in future uh, lessons and who's guilty and who's innocent, all that stuff. Who can remarry, who can not remarry, you know. These are topics for future uh, lessons in the series. In this lesson today is about uh, managing the crisis of divorce when it's happening, whether you like it or not, whether you agree or not. And divorce happens even in the church, even to sincere Christians who love the Lord. For example, your spouse leaves you and sues for divorce because you know, she just doesn't want to be married to you anymore. I've had that. You know, ask the, the person, why are you divorcing? I just don't want to be married to this person anymore. Well, do you have a, a girlfriend? A boy? No, there's nobody else. I just don't like being married and I'm out of here. You know, I mean, I've heard that uh, uh, many times. Uh, sometimes your spouse abuses drugs or abuses you or abuses the children. And this leads to uh, divorce. Um, perhaps your child dies tragically and this leads to the destruction of the family. I've seen that happen. Family's going along well, everything is okay, and then all of a sudden you know, the child gets hit by a car and died, their child, and somehow the grieving and the, 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 the weight of sorrow caused by that tragedy somehow disintegrates the marriage. Um, your spouse refuses to have sex with you, not for days or weeks, but for years. This leads to divorce. So I can go on all day here with the scenarios taken, not from books, from real life. I can go back into my own files and pull out reasons and causes, but I think you get, you, you know, you get, the, uh, you get the gist of what I'm trying to say here. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that these things justify divorce. I'm just saying that divorce happens to people even when they're trying their best. So divorce is usually the result of some kind of failure in marriage. And failure is a form of sin. And even if we don't want to sin, like Paul tells us in Romans chapter seven, sometimes we sin anyways. So divorce happens. And when it happens to you, what should you do and what should you not do? So here's a couple of those do's and don'ts. First of all, do not let divorce define who you are. Some people carry the D word on their foreheads for the rest of their lives. 
<laughs> they allow this failure in this one area of their lives to define their entire life and their entire personality. You know, it's as if once you are divorced, it's like you've got a scar on your face. It's like somebody threw acid in your face and forevermore after that, you identify yourself through this experience. It's like someone who's been convicted of a felony and gone to prison and after they get out, they're ex-convicts for the rest of their lives. They continually see themselves through the prism of their divorce. And in the church, we often reinforce this identity by creating classes or social activities just for them. I've been in churches where they have groups, you know, I mean large churches, you know, a thousand or more, and they have social groups made up of only divorced people. <laughs> I mean, what does that say? You mean those divorced people are not allowed to mingle with others? <laughs> they have leprosy or something? or we subtly let it be known that divorced people won't be allowed to serve in any dynamic or meaningful way, well, because they're kind of damaged goods. We don't, we don't want that person to serve. Well, you know, why? Uh, aren't they qualified? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're a professional teacher. Really, well, why wouldn't they? Well, they've, they've been divorced. Really? So defining ourselves by our failures in anything, never mind divorce, in anything, leads to low self-esteem, as well as the inability to experience joy. Why? Because we don't think we deserve it. We don't deserve to be happy. We don't deserve to be joyful. We've got it like a little check system in our psyche. At the moment that some happiness or joy is coming to us, that little check system shuts that thing down. Why? Well, we're not good enough. We failed at marriage, so we're not allowed to have any joy in our life. We need to punish ourselves for the rest of our lives. Not only this, but defining ourselves by our failures often leads to a higher susceptibility to sinfulness and worldliness because we don't quite fit in the church, so we seek satisfaction for acceptance from the world. Crazy system. The problem with divorce is that it's a very public failure. So we can never get away from it. And our failure is reinforced by others in the way that they treat us, which varies from sympathy to cold rejection. I mean, you can't get ahead of this thing. And this is even for the person, quote, who's innocent. I, there's never a quote, 100% innocent person in a divorce, but let's say the individual who has been wronged, right? even that individual you know, experiences the things that I've talked about. So, so you know, the do's and don'ts, if divorce happens to you, do not see yourself and define yourself through the prism of divorce. The do, well, do see yourself as Christ sees you. Not through the view of our failure or other people's perception of us, but rather through the vision of the cross of Jesus. You know, if there's one good thing about divorce, it's that it will bring you to your knees before the cross of Christ in a big hurry. It's impossible to feel self-righteous after you've been through a divorce, whether you're the so-called guilty or innocent party. It's like you've been through a, it's like you've been through a, 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 a lake of mud. <laughs> Paul the Apostle gives the true vision of our new identity as Christians in 1 Corinthians. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, 
but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Now Paul doesn't mention, quote, divorce here because it usually is the result of these other sins. And this, isn't our, you know, this is not like some, some kind of exhaustive list of sins here. He just mentions like the biggies. You know? But what Paul does say to these people about what, uh, about what they should do, what does he say to them? He tells them not to define themselves by their old selves, adulterers, fornicators, drunkards, divorcees, whatever. Don't, don't define yourself by that, but rather by your new self in Christ. And what is the new self in Christ? Well, he says they're cleansed or washed. What does that mean? Well, forgiven. You know, you come out of the waters of baptism, you're forgiven everything in the past, in the, you're forgiven everything. And our human mind sometimes can't get you know, our brain around that idea because we could never do that. We could never forgive somebody else for everything they've ever done. We can never forgive even ourselves for things that we've done in the past. You know, that's forgiving us. So we, we have trouble imagining that God could forgive us for everything we've ever done. He says, view yourself as holy, meaning special and set apart for God. And it's hard for a person who's experienced divorce to feel that way because they feel set apart, not for God, they feel set apart because of their failure. And he says, and righteous. In the Bible, being righteous means you are acceptable to God. You're okay with God. And that's hard to understand because we're not okay with ourselves because we're continually beating ourselves for having you know, messed up in the area of marriage, whether it was the other person's fault mainly or whether it was our fault. And you know, when I'm talking here, I'm not talking just to the quote innocent, I'm talking to guilty and innocent people who have gone through a divorce. See yourself in this new way. Act according to this new vision and your feelings about yourself will follow. So divorce hasn't changed your status with God. I repeat that. Divorce has not changed your status with God. You're still washed and holy and righteous because of the cross. Obviously, if you've done something, and again, you know, I, I can't say everything that I want to say about divorce and that, in one lesson. So some people are probably thinking now that are watching this or even you in the class are thinking, well, what about that person, you know, the one who left, the one who committed it, what about that person? Well, I'm going to talk about that person. We're going to cover all the characters here, but I can't do it all in one single 30 minute lesson. For now, we're assuming that divorce has already happened to you. Okay. So if divorce has happened to you, you need to think about yourself the way God thinks about you. You still have access to the throne of grace through prayer and confession of sin and failure. Yes, I'm divorced and yes, you know, uh, maybe I didn't cause it and so on and so forth, but I, I know that I did some things that may have provoked it. What do I do now? Well, what, is, what does God say for us to do? He says, but if we walk in the light, 1 John 1, but if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, meaning if we say, well, the divorce happened, but I am 100% innocent. That, that's what he's saying here if in that context. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. You're deluded. You need counseling. If you've been through a divorce and you think you had zero to do with that, you need counseling. You need to, you know. We're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, the innocent party, you know, who's only 10% responsible, let's just say, if we confess that 10%, right, the blood of Christ. For, and what about if you're the guilty party, 90% responsible? Well, the same passage applies. If you confess, you're 90%. 
See, the problem is we want, we want to make sure that the innocent party, whatever small contribution they've made to the divorce, gets wiped clean and they can move on. But the guilty person, let's make sure that that person suffers forever. Well, no. <laughs> the gospel is there for both parties. Both parties have access to the same cross. That's the gospel. That's the part we have trouble getting our brain around, how God is good. I can understand how God is good to me because I'm a pretty good person. <laughs> but I don't understand how God can be good to that rotter, <laughs> you know, that, that, that loser that married me and dumped me. I don't get how God can be good to that person. The cross of Christ is over us, even in failure especially in failure. Why do you think he went to the cross? So the big difference is that when divorce happens, we may become more aware of our need for God's grace than ever before. And this, believe it or not, is a blessing that comes in the wake of our tears. We draw closer to God. We really begin to appreciate the idea of grace. So, if divorce has happened to you, don't define yourself by failure. Define yourself by the vision of the cross. All right, number two. Number two, don't punish yourself. The role of judge and punisher belongs to God, Romans 12, 19. Even when the person is yourself. I've found that many times both partners punish each other in the wake of a divorce and the guiltier of the two tries to make amends in some way. Not always, but I've seen this happen. You know, they, they run away from God or they overindulge their children or they reinforce their low self-esteem with criticism of themselves or they define themselves by their failure. The innocent or less guilty punish themselves with regret and self-doubt. In other words, what did I do wrong? What could I have done to make him stay, to make her stay? They wallow in self-pity, anger, resentment, long after this phase of grief should be over. I mean, sure you feel that way if you've gone through this experience. Of course there's grief. Of course there's anger and regret and resentment and self-pity. I mean, yeah, of course. There's that. You wouldn't be a human being if you didn't feel that. But five years down the road, you're still there? Really? Come on. And they also doubt that the Lord really loves them because if He did, this wouldn't be happening to them, right? I did, it. I did everything. Lord, I even came Sunday nights. <laughs> and the marriage still fell apart. You know, there are plenty of people and ways that will ensure that you will be punished for your divorce. I mean, you may lose income, the emotional trauma, the breakup of your home, the loss of your friends, your prestige, your career mobility, possible rejection from your family, and even your church. So don't you be punishing yourself. There's plenty of punishment coming. <laughs> you, you need to be your own best friend here. It is what I used to say to our children when they were younger and they were fussing and fighting with each other, you know, and saying mean things to each other. And I would say, guys, be nice to each other because once you get out in the world on your own, there's plenty of people out there that are going to hurt you, that are just waiting to hurt you. You need to stick together. You need to have each other's back. And it's the same thing. You don't need to add more punishment to the mix by beating yourself up. So don't punish yourself. Instead, help yourself. Help yourself, do those things that will minimize the damage to yourself and to your family. For example, protect yourself legally. Divorce is a legal action that reverses the legal contract that you made in marriage. Now some think that the legal action is the sin. 
but the sin comes long before the divorce papers are ever signed. Some people think the guilty party is the, people that, is the person that actually files the paper for divorce. No. The breaking of the covenant, the adultery between a husband and wife takes place in a thousand little ways as one or the other begins to untie the knot that binds them in marriage. Because when the Bible talks about marriage, it talks about it being a knot, you know, you're, you're, you're together. And when it talks about divorce, it doesn't use a legal term. Like when we say divorce, it's a technically a legal term, you know, the annulment of the contract. When the Bible talks about divorce and it uses the English word divorce, the actual Greek word that's there means to unloosen. In other words, you've got a knot and you unloosen and untie the knot. Well, that knot gets untied in a thousand little ways over months and years. Harsh words, unkind actions, you know what I'm saying. A thousand little ways you start undoing that little knot until finally it's just apart. The divorce papers, you know, that's just burying the dead body. You know, the funeral isn't what kills the person, right? The funeral isn't what kills the person. The funeral is what buries the person. It's, you have to have a death certificate. Well, a divorce, it isn't the divorce that killed your marriage. Your marriage was dead long before you got to the divorce court. The divorce court simply is the death certificate to your marriage. It acknowledges the reality of the situation. No, it's the breaking of the covenant that binds in marriage. In a thousand, that's why I say it's rarely one person's total fault, because you know, both parties, you know, are, they, they, they both tug at that knot many times. Jesus didn't say that people couldn't do this. He said that they shouldn't do this, and they sin when they do. Some people interpret Matthew 19.6, as meaning that it's impossible to be divorced, you know, like that God doesn't recognize that you're actually divorced. No, that, that's a Catholic idea. That's sacramentalism. The Bible says this is what God wants, a man, one man, one woman bound together legally in marriage and they maintain that union for life. That's what God wants and that's it. Uh, anything else is not what God wants. Two men, one woman, two women, one man, a man and a man, a woman and a woman. You know, he doesn't want that. It's one man, one woman for life. He doesn't say that that can't be broken. He just says when you break that, it's a sin. You're breaking the covenant. So when the covenant is broken for whatever reason, it is naive to think that legal matters will resolve themselves, especially when children, a family home, or a business is involved. And I speak to men here, a lot of men, they just want out, I just want to get out, doesn't matter, you can have everything. And then all of a sudden they realize a little farther down the road, oops, <laughs> I wanted to get out so badly I was willing to sign over everything. Well, wait a minute, you invested 12 years in paying off the mortgage of that house, and the bank account, your furniture, your boat, really, you want to give all that up? Or flip it around the other way. The woman, I just want it out. It doesn't matter. I don't care. But all of a sudden I don't care. Oh, 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 I've got a child to take care of. How am I going to support myself? What about the money I paid into the mortgage? You know, the, the contribution financially that I made. Or the contribution as a homemaker that I made into this marriage, into this business. So we need to you know, help yourself. Think. I encourage people to minimize the financial trauma to yourself and family by having someone else mediate the legal actions involved in a divorce. Hopefully someone who wants not only to protect you, but also to do what's best for your family. A lawyer or mediator who is not just out to win or extract revenge and punish. Some people hire a lawyer and give instructions to you know, make maximum damage on the other partner. And when they do that, who do you think they're hurting? Well, they're hurting themselves. They may be hurting the partner, but they're hurting themselves too. Why? Because the partner is going to want payback. 
So a lawyer or mediator who is not just out to win or extract revenge, but somebody who has a longer range view of how life plays out after the divorce and will guide you accordingly. Because what happens many times, even after a difficult divorce, several years go by, the, the, the partners grow up a little bit, they mature, they begin to understand the whys of the divorce and so on and so forth, but they still have children together, they still have interests together. They find that they have to cooperate with one another. You know, we're not married to each other anymore, but we're still parents. We still need to be kind to each other. We still need to kind of treat each other with a, a measure of respect. I may not have love for you anymore as a partner. I may not want ever to take you back you know, as a partner, but we produce this child or these children together at a time when we did love each other and we owe it to our children. Because I, I tell divorced people, your children want to love both of you. It's hardwired into them. They want to love daddy, even if daddy's a rotter, even if daddy dumped everybody and took off with his secretary. You know, it doesn't, to the child, that doesn't count. That child wants to love daddy. Or mommy, if it's the other, you know what I'm saying. They want to love their parents. We don't do ourselves a favor if we try to change our, if we try to um, train our children to hate their parent or to disrespect them. That comes back to us in a negative way. Another example of helping yourself is to uh, guard your faith. You know, reach out to those who can minister to you in the church, not for them to take sides, but to help you and your family in a time of crisis. Seek out those people who will pray with and for you and who can give you counsel and, and, and keep you accountable. Remember I said when you're going through that depression of divorce and so on and so forth, you, you, know, you start to, you're lonely, you're angry, you do dumb things. My husband cheated on me, that rot no good, blah, blah, blah. I'll show him, you know. I, I can have a one night stand too. Really, is that what you want to do? As a Christian woman, really? This is, this is going to somehow even the score? You need f Christian friends who are able to keep you accountable, who can say to you, you're going where tonight? You're, you're planning on doing what tonight? Really? You need that kind of friend. You need that kind of Christian friend that'll you know, challenge you if you think you're doing something that is destructive. And divorce often separates people from the body of Christ, so be proactive in guarding your faith. You know, I have to say that elders and ministers are not always helpful during these times because we're more concerned about the doctrinal fallout of the divorce issue and less focused on just helping folks who are suffering. That's the feedback that I've gotten a lot of times from members who've gone through this. I believe we should see this, you know, a divorce happening, like an emergency room situation in a hospital. For example, a patient is brought in with a gunshot wound sustained in a barroom fight. At the moment, the doctor's job is to stop the bleeding and save the patient's life. Not point out that drinking alcohol is immoral, hanging out in bars is unchristian, and fighting other drunks can be dangerous, especially if they're packing guns. <laughs> I mean, there'll be plenty of time for that if the patient survives the gunshot wound. <laughs> we got to get him through the you know, through the surgery first. Well, we have to remember that people who are going through divorce have sustained a serious emotional and spiritual wound that can ruin their lives and ruin their faith. So our immediate task is to save the patient. If we do that, we may then have a chance to help them change the things that led to their marital failure in the first place. Finally, when going through a divorce, most important, do not try to justify yourself. It's human nature. 
We try to rationalize, excuse, or justify our behavior. Do not do this. When there's a divorce, it's the result of a failure in marriage, and when a marriage fails, there's enough blame to go around for everybody. Of course, people try to justify themselves in the church because we use the terms guilty or innocent party in the divorce equation. We always want to know, well, who's the guilty party? Well, who's the innocent party? It's true that in a divorce, one party may be guilty of breaking the marriage covenant or the one to actually seek to obtain the, the actual legal judgment of divorce. But this doesn't mean that the other party is completely innocent in the matter. You see, when we try to justify ourselves in the divorce process, we damage ourselves in several ways without knowing it. First of all, our sense of self-righteousness prevents us from learning anything from the failure of our relationship. I mean, if we're the innocent party, so we got nothing to change, we got nothing to learn. Because I'm the innocent party. Well, what do I have to change? I'm the victim. Secondly, we'll never be free or have a clear conscience. People think that only the guilty party should have a guilty conscience, but in my experience, even the most innocent of parties still struggle with the problem of guilt. Now most people try to justify themselves because they're too proud to admit fault or they're afraid that people in the church will reject them if they ever remarry. Because for many people, only the innocent party can remarry in good conscience. That's, that's yeah. That's a problem in the church. Like I said, I can't say everything I have to say about marriage and divorce and remarriage in one 30 minute lesson. We'll tackle this issue further down, the, further down the line. But for now, this is one of the reasons why there's all of this push and shove here. We want to determine who's guilty and who's innocent for future reference. But justifying ourselves, it may work with others and with our outward selves, but our conscience and our spirit usually get twisted up trying to accomplish self-righteousness. And the fallout usually results in you know, a loss of faith or, or we, be, we become in, invisible in the church. You know, we're there but we're not active. Or we, we go to the other extreme and we become super servants and we work off our guilt. In all of these scenarios, the short-term gain which is acceptance through self-justification, is not worth the long-term pain of fear and loneliness and nagging guilt and dread. So do not try to justify yourself. Do, however, cast yourself on the mercy of God. When in doubt, Appeal to God's mercy. <laughs> that's my, that's my go-to position. When in doubt, I go to God's mercy. You know, when Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will, I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And when Peter says, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 7. You know, what burdens is he talking about? What worries is he talking about? What cares do you think they are referring to? Money? Well, yeah, sure, we have cares. We have worries about, will I have enough money? Food? Yeah, I know a lot of people who worry, will I have enough food to eat? How about the people in Haiti who, you know, who lost their homes? Illness? We, I mean, we could stay busy seven days a week visiting people just in this church who are sick and homebound. So yes, these basic things we need to cast upon the Lord, of course. But surely both Jesus and Peter are also talking about the burden of sin and failure, the worry of a guilty conscience, the concern for our future and our souls. And divorce is just one more sin, one more failure in a long life filled with the imperfection that we experience as flawed human beings. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. It's a sin. It's a sin. It's one of the sins that sent Jesus to the cross to pay for. 
Why is it that we'll allow Jesus to pay for, to make restitution morally for our stealing, our murders, our lies, our sexual immorality, you know, all the ugly stuff, but when it comes to our divorce, we think we've got to go and make restitution. What makes us think that? Where did we get that idea? It's certainly not in the Bible. The only way to be free of the crushing guilt and sadness, the only way to be released from the resentment and the anger and the regret is to lay this burden down at the cross of Christ and not try to carry it yourself through the power of self-justification. This only leads to more failure. The only solution is to throw yourself upon the grace of God and the mercy of Christ at the cross of Christ. In other words, as hard as, I, as it might be for you, let Jesus pay the moral price for your failure in marriage. Just like he paid the price for your failure in not telling the truth all the time and not being sexually pure all the time and being addicted to whatever you're addicted to all the time. You know, we let him pay the price for that. For those who are not Christians, the good news is that all sins and failures are washed away in the blood of the cross of Christ as you are baptized in His name. Acts 22, 16. My wife Lise made a, a comment long, long ago that has you know, stayed in my mind about Acts 2.38, Pentecost Sunday. Peter says, you know, they said, you know, he says, uh, the crowd says to Peter, men and brethren, what should we do? You know, and what does Peter say? Well, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, he says that to them. And my wife Lee said, you think there were any divorced people in that 3,000? <laughs> you think there might have been some who were married, divorced, remarried, divorced and remarried again in that crowd of 3,000 people? I think so. I don't think you could ever get a crowd of 3,000 people together and not have somebody in that 3,000 have experienced failure in marriage. Did you hear Peter say, Okay, repent all of you, you and know, be baptized, all of you people, uh, except you married people and divorced people. You people stand over here, we're going to have to have a special Bible study with you people first. <laughs> he didn't say that. The water is here, come on down, he said. Yeah, whatever sins, but, but I, 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 I've had gay sex, come on down. Well, I've been an actress in porn movies, that's okay, come on down. I've been married three times and divorced, that's okay, come on down. Sin is sin. Jesus died for sin. Anybody who says differently is not preaching the gospel. So that means that when you repent, not justify yourself, when you repent, what I did was wrong, I'm sorry. I'm going to do my best never to do that again. When you repent of your sins and confess your faith in Christ, you leave your sins and their eternal consequences buried in the waters of baptism. And for Christians, the good news continues to be good because all the stain and condemnation of sin and failure in their lives are continually cleansed if they acknowledge their sins and cling to the cross through faith for their righteousness. That's what John is talking about. You know, walking in the light, walking in the light is not being perfect. Walking in the light means you walk in the light in the realization that you are a sinner. That's the light. That's the light. That I'm, not that I don't make mistakes, not that I don't sin. Some people think, well, walking in the light means I don't ever do anything wrong. No, walking in the light means I live my life realizing I'm a sinner and I'm doing my best and I'm thankful that Jesus forgives me when I do wrong. He says, if you walk in that life, in that light, you're not a hypocrite, you're not a liar, you're walking in the truth. And then he says, so if you walk this way, the blood of Jesus continually keeps you clean. So we shouldn't try to maintain our righteousness by claiming innocence 
through manipulation of the law or God's word, like the Pharisees who thought they were righteous because they provided a legal document to divorce their wives, but they were guilty of the greater sin of lust and disloyalty, which were the real reasons for their putting away of their wives. That's why Jesus said what he said. Or the modern day legalists who think they don't need God's mercy because they didn't initiate legal proceedings in the divorce, but if the truth were known, are guilty of a thousand acts of neglect that ultimately led to the death of their relationship. Is that hard to hear for some? Absolutely. Can God forgive that type of activity? Absolutely. You know, when it comes to divorce, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There may be one party way more guilty than the other, but I submit to you that for the healing process to begin, both parties need to seek out God's mercy and grace. That's when the healing starts. Now, please don't think I'm, I'm an advocate for easy divorce. I'm not. It's a serious sin. It's denounced by God. He says he hates divorce, Malachi 2, 16. You ever wonder why God hates divorce? He hates divorce because divorce is caused by sin. And divorce causes hurt and pain to his people. That's why he hates it. Except for extreme cases involving abuse or abandonment or sexual infidelity, divorce doesn't solve any problems. It actually creates more problems. And it leaves a permanent scar on your soul that you feel your entire life. So I don't advocate divorce, I hate it, and I see it for what it is. It's a sin, a failure, a victory of evil, a destructive power. But I'm also a realist and I recognize that human beings sin and will do so until the end of time when Christ will come and equip us with sinless bodies. <laughs> there's no divorce in heaven because there's no marriage in heaven. Until that time, I as a minister of the gospel deal with sin, all sin, including the sin of divorce with the only solution that God has provided for sin and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the solution to divorce, not self-pity, not self-punishment, not self-justification, but forgiveness and mercy through the cross of Christ for every sinner, and that includes those who sin through divorce, who come to Christ in faith and repentance. One last slide. This is why the gospel is called the good news, because for the one who has failed in marriage, knowing that there is forgiveness and the offer of renewal, that's good news indeed. All right, I managed to finish this on time. Thank you for your attention. We keep on going. We're we'll talking about the marriage bed next time. So I appreciate your attention and your uh, involvement in this class.